you know, all these different factors like four string, five string, the list is endless. So as basis, you have to be open minded because there is no standard. It was great chatting with today's guest. What a cool set of careers he has going for himself. Can't wait to let you hear about this. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contraband Conversations. We're talking today with Patrick Staples, who is a bassist in the Calgary Philharmonic Orchestra, and he has begun making bows recently. And my former student, Ian Hallis, who's been on the podcast a couple of times, has been raving about these bows. I can't wait to check them out. I'm going to be checking them out soon. So we talk with Patrick about growing up in Canada, moving to Los Angeles to attend Colburn and study with David Allen Moore and Paul Ellison, continuing his studies with Tim Pitts at Rice University, landing his job in Calgary. And then we dig into bows, repairing bows, getting into making bass bows, lessons learned, experience gained. I believe Patrick's only the third bow maker I've had on the podcast. So enjoy and quick shout out to our sponsors, Dorico, Ear Trumpet Labs, and Modacity. More on them later, but let's get into this conversation with Patrick Staples. Good to meet you. Uh, yeah, likewise. Holy <laughs> cow. Um, fantastic. Thanks so much for having me. Sure, you bet. Well, I was talking to Ian Hallis uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago, and he said you you got to you got to talk to Patrick. And Ian <laughs> Ian rarely makes a recommendation, uh, and if he if he does, it's always a it's always a good recommendation. So um, yeah, great. To, uh, how are how are things in Calgary right now? Are you have you guys been doing anything with the orchestra the last fourteen months or so, or what's what's been going on? A little bit, yeah. You know. Um mainly just sort of small ensemble type of things, depending on uh, sort of what stage of lockdown we're in, the restrictions currently in place. And um, most recently we haven't even been able to do stuff like that. So they've been just kind of reaching out to individual musicians to uh, kind of step up with any kind of solo repertoire that they want to perform on their own. Um, and it's great. We actually work with a really excellent um, videography company here in town. So they'll kind of just create these professional quality videos of anybody who wants to like step up and, and perform. Um, and they've been kind of doing it at different spaces in the city uh, all over. So yeah, that's kind of what we've been doing recently, but um, yeah, geez, I haven't played anything with the orchestras for for months now i was in a, a really cool um small chamber piece uh, but yeah just kind of been hanging out working hanging on out. bows <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you, you might see my bass in the corner there that bass has not left that front door in 14 months and so <laughs> yeah. I, I... <laughs> yeah i mean i could say the same for mine in the corner likewise so yeah i i hear you Things are, rela are relaxing finally. I know it's been rough in Canada, um, uh, but it's it, things have finally, you know, st started to uh, take a, a turn for the better here. I, I finally got, I mean, the vaccination percentage is pretty high now, and mm -hmm. I finally left the city of San Francisco for the first time last weekend. I hadn't even oh. left. I haven't hadn't even crossed the Bay Bridge. Um, I don't know wow. why. I was just like been holed up in my neighborhood for over a year, which is bizarre, but I got up to Seattle for a couple of days. I'm going to Texas next week, so things awesome. Awesome. starting to starting to finally finally move yeah again. yeah same here you know the the vaccines here had my first shot uh i think anybody over the age of 12 is eligible to to mm -hmm. get theirs here in alberta at least so um yeah hopefully the end is in sight mm -hmm. and yeah can get back to normal at some point so at, at some point i've heard calgary is a cool calgary sounds like a cool town i've never i've never visited i've been I'm, i've horribly badly traveled in canada i've been up to like oh, i mean win you know a couple a couple spots but not not there were you gonna I've, say winnipeg uh, uh no i was i was i actually is it windsor what's the one that's across oh, from windsor. Detroit? okay yeah, yeah that's yeah. More, that's much more likely i was oh, like why oh, would you go to winnipeg <laughs> well, well, I, I grew up in south dakota so it's a six-hour oh, drive okay. north to winnipeg so we 
we we uh, think of Winnipeg, you know, it's a good a friend of mine. Actually, I'm talking to him for the podcast later today. Travis Harrison was playing in Winnipeg. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mo- of mo- course. And that's to- where I played for two years as okay. well. So, okay. Yeah. We, had, we had some fun conversations. I try to never like rub it in that I'm living in California to people. But boy, I, <laughs> I, it was one January in Winnipeg and I was talking to Travis. And he was oh, describing man. the weather. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. It's <laughs> se- 72 Fahrenheit and I got the door open. So I know. Yeah. Well, it was a crazy transition for me because I went from like Calgary, then to LA for four years then Houston for two years. And then I moved from Houston to Winnipeg. And that was a pretty, uh, (laughs) pretty big shock to the system climate wise. Um, But yeah. But, but uh, Calgary is in a pretty setting, isn't it? The Canadian. Yeah. yeah. Calgary is beautiful. I mean, most people who know anything about it, uh, are familiar with its proximity to Banff National mm-hmm. Park, which is like the oldest national park in Canada. It's absolutely stunning. There's like uh, lots of pictures. Of, it's called like Reddit Lake. <laughs> I mean, it's not called that, but the internet has dubbed Moraine Lake Reddit Lake because it's like this beautiful, like pristine. I think it's like the most photographed lake in the world or something like that. Yeah. It keeps popping up on Reddit all the time. Um, but just, yeah, our, our proximity is to just pristine beautiful nature the mountains it's a really really beautiful place to be for sure yeah got to go one of these days so but uh yeah please yeah. probably in the summer but <laughs> although it can't, it, can't, it can't be nearly as bad as winnipeg right i mean that is like no a no definitely not yeah winnipeg in the winter it's like months of just unbroken cold like minus 20 celsius for months in a row but at least in calgary you get this weather phenomenon called a Chinook, which is basically just this mass of warm air that blows in from the coast over the mountains. And it creates this cool effect of this huge, like gray arch in the sky. There's just like this big cloud. And when you see that, you, you know, like, oh yeah, it's going to be like above zero for a few days. So that's really nice to just, you know, have a little bit of a break in between the minus 20 but uh yeah certainly certainly much more mild winters than winnipeg that's for sure well where did you grow up calgary born okay. and raised oh, yeah okay yeah so this so, is my hometown okay wow so then calgary yeah. and then to and then to la mm-hmm. what was that like because I'm, I'm from uh you know sioux falls south dakota is not known for its great weather i mean it's it's not as bad as winnipeg because it's six hours north <laughs> of sioux falls but sioux falls is right yeah. I, I can't say anything bad about sioux falls because my mom listens to the podcast and she'll <laughs> she'll, she'll I'll, I'll hear from her so <laughs> uh, yeah. um, but but boy you know october sets in and and the the snow falls usually at some point and stays into i don't know april totally yeah yeah, yeah. But, and, and like me growing up i was like i w- I was like i would became intoxicated intoxicated by warm weather like i would go to california I, w- I had a lot of family in california and i would like think like i would do anything just to live by these palm trees and now oh, f- man. F- five years deep into california I, I, there's a palm tree right there i don't even think about <laughs> it but, but like what was that what was that transition like was it uh, i know you you get used to it pretty quickly actually um but yeah i mean that was wild from having grown up spent my whole life in the suburbs of calgary um and being used to the climate here, moving to LA, uh, well, as as you know, it's it's nice. You can just kind of walk around in a t-shirt and shorts all the time, and and that's pretty normal. Um, but I would always come home in the winter, like for Christmas and uh, and summers as well. So it was always kind of interesting to to go back and forth between the two climates like that. But um, it's nice. It's just comfortable all the time. <laughs> <laughs> where, where were you going to school in LA? Were you going to USC or Colburn or Colburn? Colburn. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So I did my undergrad at Colburn. Um, and that was when David Moore was still there and Paul Ellison would fly in about once a month. Um, so yeah, I was, I was there, uh, right. Kind of when it was first starting, like, I think there was something like 65 kids total. Like that was the student body when I showed up. Um, it was tiny. And so by the time I graduated, they had built the dorms, um, that entire facility. And I think the student body at that point was around like 145. And I'm not sure where it's at now. I know they're still expanding. Like they've got this new Frank Geary designed 
a whole addition and like just yeah expanding the program so um yeah but that's uh that's around the time that i was there yeah with, with david moore and paul ellison okay so you do you did you overlap with ian while you were there was that totally okay, okay. yeah yeah wow. exactly so we were okay. there together for two years yeah he showed up um because it would have been yeah my junior year okay so and then we both wound up at rice together as well so we oh, kind wow. of lived, had this really yeah we've we've spent a lot of time together as students so it was really cool um to reconnect with him recently like i'm, I'm pretty bad at keeping in touch with um <laughs> you know all my friends and teachers from back in the day uh so i hadn't spoken to ian in probably like over a year and then i i saw on your podcast that he had won the principal job of lyric opera and i was like holy cow like that's incredible and and so we reconnected and it was a lot of fun and you know i told him i'd been getting into making bows and uh one thing led to another i sent him a couple and that's how this all started i guess so uh, that's why i'm talking to you right now so yeah it's been really really fun to reconnect with uh yeah a lot of those guys from back then this episode is brought to you by Dorico, and one of the things that attracted me so much to this app is the beautiful user interface. Here's Daniel Spreadbury, Senior Product Manager, on how they thought about designing this user interface. It was building on that idea of, of having everything in its place and a place for everything, basically, and not just throwing everything at the screen and hoping that you'd be able to find your way through it. I have become a true fan of Dorico. I have the full version. I use it every single day. I use it in my lessons. I use it for, uh, I have become such a fan of Dorico. I use it every single day. I use it in my lessons. I use it for making arrangements and exercises and everything like that. There is a free version, SE, Dorico SE, and you can do everything practically that the full version of the software lets you do. So if you're doing arrangements for a student, duets or anything like that, or exercises that is perfect for you dorico.com will take you to their page on steinberg's website and i can't say enough good things about them thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast this episode is brought to you by ear trumpet labs they make an incredible mic for upright bass called the nadine and six time grammy winning jazz bassist and former contrabass conversations guest christian mcbride is a big fan christian says as an acoustic bassist it's very important for me to have this instrument amplified as naturally as possible what i love about this microphone is that it makes the instrument sound exactly how i hear it in my head honestly i don't know if you can get a better review than that the nadine is an instrument mounted condenser mic with an incredibly clear natural sound and great feedback rejection. Ear Trumpet Labs is offering a free t-shirt with mic purchase from their website. Just visit www.eartrumpetlabs.com slash contrabass to claim yours and learn more about Nadine. Yeah, small world, isn't it? It's great because I, oh, I, oh, man. Yeah. I started teaching Ian in, I believe it was fifth grade. So that it's, it's, wow, it's been yeah. fun to, and, and I don't, I don't stay in touch with all of my former students, certainly, but I, I've stayed in touch with a few and, and Ian's one of them. And it's been great to see it, uh, you know, uh, it, it feels like a lifetime ago that those, those fifth grade lessons, uh, you know, in suburban Chicago were happening, but, but oh, yeah. uh, it's crazy to see people go through their career and, and it's, it's, it's fun as a teacher when you know someone has like vastly surpassed where you got to like in terms of your instrument and i've had that with several students at this point and for me it was usually folks who went off to a school like colburn or usc or rice or something and like after they came back like freshman year they're like all right listen to that i remember very clearly it was ian or there was another uh, student that they they both came up in the at the same time named drew bands half he's been playing out oh in i know drew Baltimore. he's a good friend I, I, yeah yeah, yeah I think of course it, and so drew i remember remember that experience with Drew too. I think it was after freshman year, he came back and I thought like, oh wow, Drew's thrown down. He was playing some Hell of a Layman or something like that. So that's awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. So, so how did you get into making bows? When did you get interested in that? That's uh, that's super cool. And like, not, you know, not many people take that turn. I don't think. Yeah, I guess. Um... Well, I've been doing it for about two years now. You know, I was just looking through old photos and yeah, um, started getting into it or made my first bow or finished my first bow in April of 2019. Um, but the, I guess I got into it because I started rehairing like a couple summers before that. Yeah, 2017 is when I first started to like 
learn how to do my own rehairs. And I don't know, I was just like bored one summer and <laughs> found myself with a lot of time on my hands. And there wasn't really anywhere in town to get a consistently good base rehair. Mm -hmm. And I think as basics, we're, we've all had like a bad rehair that just didn't oh. work. And, and I get it after having, you know, learned how to do it and, and having rehaired violin viola cello bows it's it's a different thing mm -hmm. as is anything on the bass um mm -hmm. they really are kind of like their own uh i mean the process is essentially the same but i would say the likelihood of things going wrong when you're rehairing a bass bow is higher for sure just because of how much more tension mm. the hair is under how much wider the ribbon is uh just all these things um so Anyways, I, I got started doing that just because, I don't know, figured it would be a cool thing to do. Maybe make a couple extra bucks on the side, like being someone who did rehairs in town. And um, yeah, I, I enjoyed the process of figuring that out enough that once I felt like I was, you know, doing a, a good job or consistently doing a good job, uh, I was just kind of like, okay, well, I don't know. I may as well take this to the next step and like try making a bow. Like, let's see what that's like. Um, oh. So that was sort of, yeah, kind of how it all started was just through learning how to rehair. And then, yeah, slowly, you know, watching every YouTube video I could find <laughs> of like people making bows and uh, try to figure that out. So, wow. uh, yeah, that's kind of how it started. That's cool. Well, that, that, even if you're just rehearing, that's such a valuable thing. I think, every, yeah, like you're saying, every bass player knows the agony of like, especially if you live in a, it, it, I've been fortunate that I've, I've lived in Chicago and now I'm here in San mm -hmm. Francisco. And we've had good rehair people for bass in both places. I mean, the, the guy that most people go to uh, here is named Brian Campbell. Shout out to Brian Campbell. He's, he's great. Nice. And, and it's like, it's like, uh, you know, you text him like a drug dealer and you're just like, Hey, can I, know. I, you know, I don't think he has no website or anything, but yet all the <laughs> Same. people go to yeah well that's you i know, offer a cash discount too yeah yeah, yeah well, <laughs> i'll tell you that that's the mark and has been for generations of uh i think i think the people who end up being the best at things uh you know they, they don't they're too busy doing the thing to necessarily set up that website so like i never yeah. i never people have asked me because I, I don't teach much these days but i did go through a period where i taught a lot and people always ask like how do you market yourself as a teacher i said i've never marketed myself ever i started by teaching one kid and then that that kid told this other kid or their parents told the other one. And before I knew it, I was teaching, you know, uh, the students you'd probably want to be teaching, but it's, it's, exactly. it's, just, it's funny how quality sort of leads you there. Well, absolutely. I mean, it's, I remember listening to uh, the interview you did with James Ham and he talks about <laughs> building his very first base for Gary Carr. And that was the one base <laughs> player that he knew existed. And, and, and like he says, you know, if you know one base player, next thing you know, you know, a hundred. Mm -hmm. um but obviously being in the philharmonic myself like uh word gets around pretty quickly and and i know the players in town so yeah i, I really didn't kind of go out of my way to to market myself as a rehairer and it just kind of uh well yeah if you do uh i there's one uh the guy that i bought my my rehair kit from um Michael Van, he's a Canadian bow maker, and he was always say, "Yeah, if you if you do a good job, that person will tell one person. If you do a bad job, that person will tell ten people." <laughs> so, <laughs> there, 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 that is true. That that's yeah. that's that's great. It, it's um. Had you been into woodworking or anything like that when you were younger, or did you just like? Uh, I think a lot of people who end up starting making stuff like that, like their dad was a woodworker. Like I'm thinking about Arnold Schnitzer, you know, the great luthier. Mm -hmm. Like his his dad was always into. I don't. He wasn't a luthier, but he was always into building stuff. And so Arnold was like taking stuff apart when he was a kid. Did you have any of that in your background, or is it real? You just like it popped into your mind a couple of years ago. Not. Not extensively, no. I mean, my dad, for sure, he's he's very handy. Mm -hmm. He had, like, all sorts of tools and stuff in the garage and was, you know, fixing stuff himself, fixing the car, like, building a deck, built, like, this huge, uh, you know, stone retaining wall at our old house. And, um, yeah, it was always very crafty in that mm -hmm. regard. 
Um, but I, I didn't really do much with his tools. I mean, I kind of remember playing around with like his chisels and stuff as like a kid, but I, I wasn't obsessively making or tinkering with anything beyond like Legos or, or stuff like that. And um, I guess when I was in junior high and I enrolled in shop class as an option, um, I really enjoyed that. And I actually won like at the, at the end of the year, they give out all these awards, you know, in the gymnasium. And I won the, I won the shop award. Um, and I didn't really think much of it. You know, I, I, I just, I enjoyed it for sure. Uh, but once I got to high school, I didn't keep taking shop for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think cause at that point I was more interested in music. So I was of course in the band program and doing all sorts of extracurricular activities, um, music lessons and orchestra, youth orchestra, stuff like that. So that was my focus. And yeah, I didn't really touch a tool again until I got this little reherring kit, <laughs> um, you know, other than that little $10 Ikea set that comes with like a hammer and a wrench and stuff for just, you know, doing whatever around the house. Um, but I wouldn't say it was something that I, yeah, had, had always been doing. So, okay. um, I don't know. After several years of planning, I'm so happy that my course, Beginner's Classical Bass, is out on Discover Double Bass. This course is made up of 66, yes, that's a lot, <laughs> video lessons, which cover a wide range of topics on classical double bass, starting from taking your bass out of the case, which is very fun, <laughs> to film and Jeff Chalmers of Discover Double Bass, and I have a great blooper reel about that, and leading to different bow strokes, such as staccato and portato. The topics also include posture, simple scales and arpeggios, left-hand technique, bowing technique, simple pieces, which are fun to play, practice tips, and much more. You can learn more through the link in the show notes or just visit discoverdoublebass.com slash Jason Heath. I'm here with Mark Gelfer from Modacity, who has a quick tip for you on how to better your practice. That was it, folks. Silence is the tip for you today. Even taking five seconds or 10 seconds to put the instrument down in between reps, recenter your body, recenter your mind, and find a little bit of inner stillness is going to help you consolidate what you've just learned and help start building that process. It's also going to take it out of short-term memory so that when you practice the thing next, it's going to be more of a focus of putting into long-term retention and recall, which is what you really want to build. You don't want just stuff floating around in your short-term memory. So take those moments of silence, take as many as you want. It's free and it's really powerful. You can learn more about my favorite practice app and get a special deal on lifetime membership by visiting modacity.co slash CBC. And thank you, Modacity, for sponsoring the podcast. I'm always curious, you know, like, like folks, I've, I've talked to enough people that I try to s s sense out some commonalities. You weren't, you weren't, I'm, I'm guessing you weren't like a bass tinkerer then. Cause there are some people that love to like Andy Anderson, somebody who comes to mind, a colleague of mine back, he plays in the lyric opera and he's constantly like reshaping his bridge or we have, there's oh, this, no. okay. Okay. There's this guy out <laughs> I've here. Never, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've never attempted anything. Like I've never touched my sound post. I mean, yeah. I'll do little things like I, I put like a little shim of leather underneath you know my g-string to try to stop it snapping but i'm certainly not going to take my planes to the fingerboard to actually fix anything on it yeah. um let's see i don't know i dropped my sister's acoustic guitar once when i was young and i just glued <laughs> the crack up with tight bond uh <laughs> but <laughs> you know that that's i'm trying to think yeah no i i don't really tinker too much on my on my gear or I hadn't, but I, I have a quite a few tools now that I probably could and, and should, honestly. I think it would be a great thing for, for, for anyone to just sort of have a basic knowledge of, of setup or how to do minor repairs themselves. So, um, yeah. 
Well, you've probably got plate out of your plate making awesome bows now, and and if you're still doing rehairs, you know, if you assuming you're still doing that, but it's you know, it's one of those yeah. things that I think there's so much to someone like me who I just I think of the bow makers or people that work on bows as magicians, basically. You know, I have this student who I just sent her to Brian Campbell here in San Francisco, and she needed a rehair desperately, and then like everything was falling mm-hmm. apart, like the grip was falling apart. I'm like, Brian will take care of it. You know, this uh, Brian yeah. will take care of it, and he will take care of it. But like, like um, what? What is a bow rehair kit? Like, what all is in there? I, I, I have no idea what happens there. I just drop my bow off at Brian's front door, and then yeah. I come back in a couple hours, and it's like this beautiful new thing, clean. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty basic for, for rehair, and you don't actually need that many tools. Uh, also, depending on how you do it, there are a few different schools and techniques uh, for even just doing a rehair. But the kit that I bought came with um, a few little blocks. Let me see if I've got one here that I can show you. Um, But basically, uh, I don't have it handy. Uh, Yeah, just sort of like basic little wooden blocks that you can hold the frog in as you're inserting the plugs, putting the hair in. Um, I think a lot of French rehairs don't even use those. And they'll actually just keep the frog on the stick uh, as they're putting in the plugs in the hair and stuff like that. Um, But yeah, my kit came with just a couple of these little blocks, um, some thread for tying off the hair. Uh, What else? Oh, a little alcohol lamp. Yeah, Mm -hmm. you need like some kind of little alcohol lamp or flame, Uh, some parallel pliers, a chisel, um, two chisels, a couple just like squared off flat little like plug inserter things. Uh, and that's about it. You don't need a crazy extensive setup. A, a lot of people like make these jigs, like these long wooden boards that you can kind of clamp the whole bow into. I don't use that. I just have a simple vise that I use on the edge of my bench. And obviously I, I don't just stick the bow in the vise. I wrap it up <laughs> with leather. Or, or some kind of like rubber, uh, obviously, so that it's not damaging any of the wood or anything like that. But um, yeah, for, if you're just doing rehairing, you can you can get started with pretty minimal tools. And you're just you're just uh, did you did you do any any sort of formal training or did you just rock the YouTube and fi- and figure out most things that way? I'm sure you've talked just to people along the way. Rock the YouTube, yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. And yeah. you know, I I should preface everything by saying that. Um, uh, a really big inspiration uh, to getting started with any of this, or even to let me know that it was possible with my f- friend and uh, former former colleague in the Winnipeg Symphony, Zushwav Prohovnik, um, fantastic bassist and bow maker. And uh, yeah, it was it was really cool to like play in a section with a guy who was making bows and rehearing bows. And mm-hmm. yeah, it. it, it it was just great to like show up for rehearsal and like, Hey, Zishwab, can you just rehear this and like get it back next rehearsal or something like that. So, um, he was definitely somebody that I called many times when I was getting started. And, uh, he was just so supportive. And I remember breaking my first stick and calling him up <laughs> and be like, Hey, Zishwab, broke my first stick. What do I do? <laughs> They're like, oh, it's fine. Like, let's see, let's see. Like, what were you doing? It's like, yeah, don't do that. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and and you know, just so open with his knowledge and and talking to me. Um, so he was for sure a huge help. Uh, but really, just there's there's so much knowledge on YouTube. It's crazy. So, um, and and I should also say that this this kit that I bought came with a little. Uh, thumb drive with with a video course on how to rehair a bow. So it's not like wow. I was just kind of like given the tools and then left yeah. to flounder. Uh, so no, Rodney, uh, sorry, um, Michael Van mm-hmm. does a great job of just giving you sort of a step by step tutorial. And I watched that and um, I don't do it exactly that way. Because again, like anything, you kind of figure out what makes sense to you, you watch other people do it and uh, kind of combine techniques and tools um, from all over the place to sort of come up with, yeah, just a, a method that makes sense for you. So 
Really, yeah. Just watching every YouTube video I could find on the subject of rehairing or making bows, and then just a lot of trial and error. Mm -hmm. um, and that's still what I'm doing. So, <laughs> I mean, I would love, I would love to go and actually apprentice with somebody um, and just sit down and just, just having someone there to ask a question as soon as it pops into your head and, and having that sort of immediacy of feedback would for sure be really helpful. But I also enjoy the process of just kind of figuring things out. And um, yeah, that's kind of how I've gone about it so far. Well, I've been curious because I've I've gotten to know some people in the base the the base luthier world, and you know there's this wonderful. I was wondering if there was a a bow equivalent. Uh, that the there's this wonderful VSA Oberlin workshop, and I I, I got mm -hmm. a chance to go there maybe three years ago, and it's literally all these luthiers giving each other PowerPoint presentations on. I mean, one of them was called Thoughts <laughs> on Wood, and it's like and everybody's got their note. It's Amazing. like it's like what you would imagine you know continuing education would be like. Like all these people like. You know, and, and it's such a solitary thing what what a base maker does or what making a bow is. You know, and and to see all these people like once every couple of years get together and actually you know, people that usually spend all day alone in their shop trade ideas. Yeah. They had all these different woods and like here are the effects of redwood versus this versus that, and it was super cool. I, I'm I'm total amateur or pretty much, but I I was learning a lot just sitting there. Yeah, that that is super cool and. Uh, that's definitely something that I would love to attend at some point in the future uh, when when that's a, a possibility. Um, but I've, I've heard a lot of the luthiers on your podcast say that they really feel like we're living in a golden age of making. Mm -hmm. And and I truly believe that just in terms of the, the wealth of knowledge and the sharing of knowledge is, is really cool. And the fact that I can watch people do this on YouTube and like, that that's possible um, is really, really cool. So yeah, it's, it's an exciting time to be, to be making for sure. Well, I'll bet as you're, as you're rehairing, you know, you're looking at all these bows, so you're thinking about the parts mm -hmm. of the bows and then, it, but then to yeah. actually, actually make, I mean, that's where it really, and I think you were only the third bow maker I've talked to. I believe I talked to Sue Lipkins like a long time ago and yeah. then yeah. Goldberg more recently. Um, I think that's it. Maybe you may have talked to somebody else and I can't remember, but, um, but it's just such a mysterious, and this is something you know, lots of parents have asked me, like, why is one bow $500 and one bow $7,000? Yeah. And it's like, what's different? I'm like, well, <laughs> I, I don't really know exactly what to tell you. Um, <laughs> like... I know. Yeah. It's, uh, it's weird, especially if you're a beginner, because I remember shopping for my first bow mm -hmm. and ordering a bunch from lemur and trying them out and mm -hmm. and and my teacher is sort of explaining also like okay well you the, these are the various price ranges of bows mm -hmm. and me just sort of shaking my head like you got to be kidding me you're telling me that this stick of wood makes a difference in the sound mm -hmm. and so if you're a beginner that's it's uh it's really hard to believe <laughs> um, that it makes a difference is because your ears can't detect it. Like you're not experienced enough as a player uh, to even be able to tell not just nuanced differences in sound, but like big differences in sound. Like it all just kind of sounds the same and, and you don't sound the same from one day to another. So uh, yeah, I can see why it would be very, very tricky to explain to a beginner or a parent of a beginner, um, but it's it basically boils down to materials, craftsmanship, experience, expertise, uh, time, all these things. So, yeah. Yeah, if the analogy I use, and I think this analogy is falling apart as our cell phone cameras get so much better, but I would always use the camera analogy. You know, it's like I, I got my point and shoot. Yeah, this is an old analogy because cameras gotten so much better, but yeah. like my two megapixel Canon <laughs> Pixma, you know, would take X image. And then if you get like, uh, you know, DSLR, that's better. And then if you get, some, you know, like the the latest, the Canon R5 or something, you know, 8K, you know, it's it, that uh, those, but the jump from the Pixma just up to the next level is so great. And then those gradations, 
expressions. Uh, maybe the expert eye can see them better. But but boy, I mean, it still baffles me to this day. Like I was trying out this Rodney Moore bow uh, that I told myself I wouldn't buy, and then I almost bought it anyway. And then it got <laughs> one at an auction, so I I just got to send it off and not have to make oh, a decision. Um, yeah. But you know, it was changing the way I was playing. And I've I've had this I've had this Baron Doling bow, which I like. It it's is it the ideal bow? No. Is it do I? It's I it's the bow I deserve. I don't think I'm I don't think my play I, like it's a good bow. I don't I don't know that I need, but it's still it it's it's incredible. And and I remember. Um, playing in this chamber orchestra in Memphis for many years. And Michael Stern, Isaac Stern's son, is the conductor. It's called the Iris Orchestra. And uh, Michael was lending one of his viola bows to one of the violas. And I think it was, you know, insured for like $18,000 or something ludicrous, like this little, yeah. little wig. But it's just, it's, it's, it's just incredible how different it can sound and how different the way that the balance is or the way it feels in your hand or whatever shapes your playing. You know, in some ways, I think... Uh, it's it's maybe a bit like no, it's probably even more so than this. But you know, I, I think when we play around with bass strings, most bass players like to keep mm -hmm. on bass strings. And I think when you get a certain distance from the bass, I don't know that the differences are as great as we think. But it it changes how you feel about playing, and so it does change oh, yeah. your playing. And I mean, the bow I think really can't, like I recorded myself, and I would actually look at the waveform, and that Rodney Moore bow was pulling different frequencies than my Baron Doling, which um, totally. So, yeah, it's it's yeah, just it's super cool. Yeah, oh. it really is, and it's such a gratifying feeling when you play on a bow that truly does kind of like solve all your problems. Or, <laughs> or um, I mean, at least it feels good if it's within your price range and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's something that you can actually you know take home with you. But yeah, it's one of those things where you it it is such an enormous part of your technique mm -hmm. um that it's 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 so critical and and to get to yeah a place where you know what you like or, or and that's even hard like I, I don't know a lot of the times i feel like i i won't know what i like until i try it and mm -hmm. um but when you do try something that like i said just kind of feels like it works with you and uh, whatever, like now all of a sudden spiccato isn't this labored chore or string crossings, whatever, or just, you know, responding properly with your instrument or your strings or your setup. Um, there are so many factors at play. Uh, but yeah, when, when you find a bow that really kind of clicks with you and your setup, man, it's, it's a great feeling because it's, it's like, oh, great. Don't need to practice anymore. I got this bow. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. You can almost... I, I, Not I, I, really, but you know what I mean. Oh, yeah, I totally know what you mean. I, I, another, it's like, I, I haven't quite figured out how to describe it, but like when I got that doling bow, that was enough of an upgrade that like, uh, like from my previous bow that I almost felt like I could be sloppier. And sloppier is the wrong mm -hmm. word, but, but it would just work better. And, and, that's, yeah, and then yeah. I went to that Rodney Moore bow and Spiccato in particular is like, oh, this bounces like a race car. You know, it's just incredible... Um, what, what have you, uh, what have you experimented with in turn? I mean, we could talk about so many things, but like, like weight length, like, like, like what, what have you played? Have you, have you come to, are you, I, I'm sure you're continuing to experiment with, with, uh, parameters, but like, For what's, sure. but maybe what's your, what's your journey been like so far in terms of what you've been experimenting? I mean, I've experimented with all those things, um, length, weight, octagonal round, mm -hmm. um, woods, uh, hair width, like mortise width, um, camber, um, most, most things I, <laughs> I've exper experimented with a, a little bit. Cause like I said, I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of getting started. So yeah. it's not like I've, you know, um, have a lifetime of bow making to reflect on mm -hmm. by any means, but, um, yeah, it's, it's been really cool to see what makes a difference, what makes less of a difference than you might think, mm -hmm. um, what other people perceive. Like, it was really interesting sending these uh, two recent bows to Ian, getting his feedback and, and seeing which of the two he preferred, which was actually the opposite of the one. The one that he, he kept um, was the one that I didn't, prefer on my setup mm -hmm. just 
sound and feel wise. So that was really interesting. Um, and I've had that experience with other players as well, other clients. And um, it's really hard to judge or know or predict what the bow you make is going to ultimately play or sound like on any given player's setup. Yep. So, um, but anyway, like, yeah, I've experimented with all, all kinds of things like taper diameters, weights, lengths. Um, yeah, it's been, been cool. Well, and yeah, and we're so non-standardized in, in our base shapes exactly. and how we play and, the, all, and our needs and everything. And it's, 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 uh, yeah, there's, there's so many parameters. And, and I even remember, you know, trying some, it's like, I'm looking at like essentially the exact same bow from the exact same maker, both like, let's say they're both round sticks, the same length, the same weight, more or less, you know, as many factors as you can control, probably in control, yet they sound different, yet they play just a little different. I know. And I've, I've made plenty of bows that were what you could call like sister bows where they're both cut from the same blank. They're as close mm -hmm. as possible, you know, to, to the same growth rings in the tree um, and exact same dimensions, camber weight as much as possible. And they're a little bit different all mm -hmm. the time, just because that's wood. It's an organic material. The cell structure is going to be ever so slightly different even from within the same board so um it's both maddening and exciting <laughs> <laughs> at the same time i guess um so yeah and like you said there's so little standardization for the base that um what one person loves another person's gonna hate just because of how they play what they're used to so yeah yeah what, what so I, I'm guessing the wood makes uh, a lot of difference, and that's one of the things you can control the least. What are, what are some things that maybe don't make as much of a difference as non bow makers think? Like you said, you played like like our uh, I I'm, I I've heard or read that octagonal versus round stick. You know that that there's less of a difference than maybe I know mean, some people have a preference for one, preference for the other. I don't know what what uh, what have you found so far that's like doesn't seem to be as big a factor. Well, that's, that's a good example, the round versus octagonal. Um, and it's one of those things that's very, uh, it, it's impossible to really scientifically talk about in other, in anything other than very abstract terms that have no basis in reality or real world bows. Like essentially to do a proper scientific comparison, I think you would need to make two bows out of a synthetic material that was just completely consistent um you know not like wood where you're dealing again with like different growth rings and grain patterns stuff like that so you would need to have two bows made out of a synthetic material that was like very cellularly consistent and one would have to be round and one would have to be octagonal but the round one would have to have a slightly thicker stick diameter uh, to compensate for the weight difference because an octagonal bow, um, if you have an octagonal bow and a round bow that are exactly the same diameters, the octagonal bow is going to be stiffer and heavier because there's more material there because of the corners. You know, if you're, if you're looking at an octagon on, the, on top of a circle on a piece of paper, those, the corners just take up more surface area. So, um, yeah, it, that's what I mean by saying it's impossible to really compare because anytime you're comparing two different bows, you're comparing two different bows, mm -hmm. two different pieces of wood. And as we just discussed, they can be cut side by side from the same board of wood, but they're still going to be slightly different. Um, so making any kind of judgment about the sound or the playability of octagonal versus round, um, well, I don't know. I just don't. I haven't been convinced by any kind of scientific <laughs> proof. Uh, aesthetically, absolutely. You can say that you prefer one or the other, but that's kind of about as, as much as you can say about it as far as I'm concerned. But um, I don't know, maybe somebody has done an experiment like this and uh, I'd be very curious to uh, look over the data, but 
it's not it's, that I'm it's, aware of. It's got to be the bowmaker equivalent of the flat back versus round back. You know, uh, ben, ben, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Ben Puglisi, a uh, wonderful uh, bass luthier in us in Melbourne, Australia, uh, made he made two bases. He tried to solve or be you know uh, take out as many variables as possible. He made these two bases, uh, h- hilariously or ironically or whatever the term is. Both of the, one of them is now owned by Christian McBride. One's owned by Larry Grenadier. So they both one's round back, one's flat back. They both work well nice. but before those ended up in their hands he made it's like same exact pattern same shape same uh wood sort like everything was the same except one was a round back and one was a flat back and he broke out some gear to analyze the frequency spectrum and just see and it was i think i i don't remember what it was basically exactly the same there was like a slight uh, uh, lower frequency boost in one and higher frequency boost in the other. And I can't remember, I'd have to go back and listen, uh, to remember mm-hmm. which it was, but it was, it was way less, but you know, again, like round versus octagonal people think they like a flat back or think they like a round back. And I think that personal preference, you know, whether it's a placebo effect or whatever, that's, uh, that's for sure. Thing. And it, it makes sense too, because it's such a obvious, physical visual difference uh, between two things. And if you like one more than the other, or if you have tried, let's say a a good number of bows and out of those bows, you have, you happen to have preferred the octagonal ones. It's logical to make that uh, assumption that you prefer octagonal sticks, but Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a false correlation. I don't think that you can make that inference. Uh, You just happened to have liked doc- these two bows that happened to have been octagonal. Yeah. Um, so yeah, probably the same deal with flat versus round back. Well, then the other thing, and, and this takes me back to that Oberlin, uh, exploring different woods, you know, the whole issue of like finding woods outside of Pernambuco mm-hmm. to make bow. And, and like, I've played around with, you know, certainly snake wood bows, this Catalox bow that I tried by Rodney Moore, I particularly liked oh. this Mexican hardwood that apparently is, is abundant. Uh, it sounds like it's, it's much less of an issue to source that, but I know that that, um, have you experimented outside of the Pernambuco world? Uh, with exclusively. Oh, wow. So I have never made a Pernambuco bow. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, so all of the wood that I've used has been non Pernambuco, uh, uh, because I don't have access to it. Yeah, and right. I don't, I don't know how people get it these days. It's, yeah. um, it's, it's very heavily regulated because it's, I think CITES to regulate. It's basically very endangered, uh, yes. and very protected as it should be. So first and foremost, I just don't have a reliable source of Pernambuco. And I think that unless you have apprenticed with a maker that kind of amassed a lifetime supply and then passes that on to you, uh, I don't know how you get it. Um, At least with any kind of regularity or quality control. so right from the get-go, my uh, sort of philosophy of making always revolved around using alternative woods. And again, big shout out to Zishwav. Um, he was doing that and with great success. Like I remember trying one of this Purple Heart bows that he had made and just thinking it was absolutely incredible. And Masaranduba is also a popular wood choice. Um, so the two woods that I've been using have been Ipe, uh, another really dense Brazilian hardwood. It's about 30% more dense than Pernambuco. Hmm. Um, not as dense as snake wood, but um, I've been using that and uh, another wood called Bankerai, which is this kind of light honey brown colored hardwood, um, which is much, it's, it's much softer than Ipe and softer than Pernambuco even. So um, yeah, these are just factors that you, you take into account when you're designing the, the bow geometry. Um, but yeah, I've had good success with both, both of those woods and uh, plan to keep using them in the future as well as others. I've, I've picked up a board of bloodwood the other day. I've got a bunch of nice. purple heart. Um, 
So, yeah. Cool. I can't wait to see this. I always get excited to see um, bows not, you know, made out of other other materials. And it, it kind of reminds me of the, the great luthier I love out here on the West Coast, Seth Kimmel. He's in Eugene, Oregon. Totally. Yeah, yeah. So his mm. base is, I talked to him years ago about just he, thoughts. He brought up the topic, like like just general thoughts on tone wood and, and characteristics. Because Seth uses redwood. He uses yeah. various kinds of spruce. He uses all sorts of things. And he tries to the source from the Pacific Northwest, you know, so it's here in the States uh, for him. But uh, yeah, really interesting to see what's what's out there. And again, thinking back to that Luthier, that VSA, seeing all these all these other materials that 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 people are considering, just knowing not that we're going to run out of spruce or maple, but certainly for the the hardwood, the exotic woods, the the hard to source. Wood. Yeah, I know it's, it's really cool. And that's that's something that's probably one of, the, one of the more exciting things for me to witness in the luthier world and bow making world in general is just people experimenting with different mm -hmm. woods. And I think we've been fed a lie that <laughs> you must have an instrument with maple size back spruce top. You must have a Pernambuco bow. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's such a kind of, um, it's, it's just so accepted as, as dogma at this point that these are the only suitable materials for high quality bows or instruments. And I think a lot of that has to do with just, there was one luthier you had, uh, Matthew. M Matthew Tucker? M Matthew Tucker. And I yeah. think, and, and I, I think he was the one that mentioned like, these are just pleasant materials to work with. They plane mm -hmm. really well or whatever. They just machine really well. And that's mm -hmm. why luthiers favor them. Um, and they just obviously work and sound and look really good too. So that's, that's a big part of it, but are they the only materials that will work? Absolutely not. It's the, it's the challenge of doing something that has this long tradition and this, this you know, somewhat ri ri yeah. rigid. That's something I, I really loved about the the late, great Patrick Charton, the luthier from mm -hmm. Paris, who made these. He just he just questioned everything. He said, just because we've made a scroll that looks like this doesn't mean that this is the way to do a scroll necessarily. Just because we've done. And so he, he had created all these really, I just found them fascinating. This suitcase base that would fold yeah. down. I mean, it really. Yeah. That's yeah, wild. Yeah, yeah. And so it's whether whether you want to go that way or not. It's just it's cool to see, um, just see some of those uh, long held uh, beliefs and materials and such. Uh, I know, and I think part of the reason that I'm so glad to be, at least at this point, exclusively making bass bows is because bassists in general are such an open minded mm -hmm. group. I mean, from day one, you're handed a bass and. <laughs> like just so you know you can either play it with this kind of bow it's called a french bow or you got this kind of bow it's a german bow like yep. i do this one so maybe you should too but from day one you're aware that there are very different approaches uh technique wise gear wise to how to play this thing and i think that that is only you know that sentiment only deepens the further you get into it because then it goes like, oh, you want to stand, you want to sit, you're going to use a straight pin, a bent pin, a steel, mm -hmm. carbon fiber, wood pin. You're mm -hmm. going to, you know, all these different factors like four string, five string, the list is endless. So as basis, you have to be open minded because there is no standard. That yeah, well put. I've made a second or third career, or whatever, uh, going down to these music education events, and doing and uh, explaining those things to confused educators. You'll you'll never yeah. you'll never you'll never go to a music education <laughs> conference and not have a de demystifying the double bass sort of session. And so, but that's the yeah. beauty of it too. That's why it's got to be fun to totally. play around as a as a luthier or or bow maker or what have you, or or uh, you know someone who's experimenting with end pins and that sort of thing. We're we're definitely. I think that some other instruments share that i think trombonists some of the it's the lower instruments tend to, tend yeah. to like to goof around <laughs> experiment a little bit more maybe violinists are too busy just learning all the notes but <laughs> yeah they're too busy playing playing notes and music <laughs> <laughs> Hey, it is it is great to chat with you. Even if you even if you hadn't gone down this bow making path, we could talk bass and uh, and and a million other things. I, uh, I I I just love that you and Ian have this long history together. That is that is so cool, and um, I can't wait to check out some of your bows. It sounds it uh, sounds like you're doing great work. Yeah, I, I know that uh, they're on their way to you at some point, I believe. So beautiful. I'm I'm thrilled to uh, yeah see what you think, and and thanks so much for having me. It was a, a real pleasure. 
Patrick. You rock. Thanks for chatting, folks. Check him out on Instagram. You can see his bows. Follow along with what he's up to. And I can't wait to check out these bows. What a fascinating art bow making is. And it's just so interesting to me how people end up doing this. The other two bow makers, and I may be missing somebody, but Brianna Goldberg, I talked to a couple of years ago on the podcast. She's based down in Los Angeles. And then Sue Lipkins, I talked to in maybe 2015 or something like that. And yeah, how fascinating that that stick and that hair and just all of those that what what seems simple <laughs> to to maybe to me at least in terms of materials how different it can really be and the different types of wood that Patrick and other luthiers are experimenting with out of necessity because of Pernambuco issues supply issues but also just the cool options that there are out there when you open up your horizons to these different woods so very cool Jason careful you're I'm in a rambly mood this morning it is early June as I record these these will go out later in June so hello where hopefully you're having good summer plans hopefully you're traveling we are in what he, now is when I don't post photos of living in San Francisco if I'm trying to like well I don't I try not to uh, like in January post photos of of palm trees and stuff like that uh, when it's cold out for a lot of folks <laughs> that I know but this is we're in what's called June gloom here in California and so even though we're into June it's like 55 and cloudy and windy and that sort of stuff and that's normal anybody who's into baseball and has ever checked out a San Francisco Giants game or or um, watch them on TV you 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 can tell it's you know not a lot of suntans in San Francisco and June in particular is cold so hope but hopefully it's not cold where you're at and you're doing some travels and I am going to be doing some more travels and leaving the city of San Francisco which is not something I've done a lot of in the last year and change but going down to LA and to go visit my mom and brother and folks in South Dakota going to be going I was going to go down to Texas uh, at the end of May that ended up not happening but I will be going down to Texas in September and yeah, just in, oh, going to L.A. again in July. So after a long time of going nowhere, they're barely even leaving my building or my certainly barely even leaving my neighborhood. It's been great to uh, relax and explore. And hopefully that's been the same for you. I, boy, I am rambling today. Okay, I better close out of here and thank the team who are Michael Cooper, Steve Henshee, Mitch Mooring, and Trevor Jones. Mitch makes beautiful bases in the Dallas, Fort Worth area in Kilgore, Texas, a couple hours east. Check out his work at mitchmooring.com. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. 